day because today we're doing a series. It's called Your Life is Worth Living. Turn your name and say, Your Life is Worth Living. And in this series, we're going through the powerful book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And in this series, what we're doing is we're unpacking chapter by chapter the book of Hebrews. And in so doing, we're discovering how amazing Jesus is and also how much your life is worth living. And I want to encourage you today, look with me at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. Before we read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, let me ask you a personal question. And you're allowed to laugh if you want. Do you ever swear? <laughs> Do you? Do you ever swear? Maybe not in church, maybe not when you're talking to me, but maybe when you're in traffic, when you're in the car and there's a bit of road rage kind of brewing inside you, or maybe with your friends, or maybe when you're by yourself, or when you're especially frustrated at something. Do you ever swear? Now, I'm not trying to make anyone feel awkward or bad or anything like that, uh, but the fact is, of course, as followers of Jesus, we want to do our best to use our words to honor God, and we're all works in progress. Uh, and you know, in fact, you're going to find that one indicator that you are growing spiritually is that you are using your words better and better, that you're more loving, more wise, more sensitive, more gentle, more powerful in the words that you use. That's all part of growing spiritually. It's in the words that we say. And see, here it is. None of us is perfect at this. We're all going to keep on working until the day we see Jesus face to face. So in the meantime, can I tell you about a time when I learned to swear? Is that okay? All right, and just to be uh, fair and to give you no full disclosure, I, I cleared this with my dad because it involves me and my dad. All right, so you're allowed to laugh at this. Turn to me say, you're allowed to laugh. Here it is. When I was 10 years old, my dad and I would play video games together every Saturday morning for about half an hour, not long, just half an hour, and we would sit in front of the TV side by side playing Nintendo Tennis. And we loved this game. We played doubles tennis on the same team, and we thought we were pretty good. And I thought we were a pretty good doubles team together. But occasionally, occasionally, in the middle of a game, sometimes my dad would make a mistake, or as they call it in tennis, an unforced error. <laughs> and this is what would happen, is when he would make an unforced error, he would immediately go, oh, shh, and you can fill in the blank, just don't do it out loud, all right? And I was like, hmm, as a 10-year-old, I was like, oh, I've never heard that before. And so the next Saturday, we're playing Nintendo tennis, and when I make an unforced error, I go, oh, shh, <laughs> fill in the blank. And he's like, what are you, what are you talking like that for? You know, there's no need to talk, I'm like, where did I get it from? I got it from you. And see, it's, it's just funny what kids will pick up from their parents sometimes. Now, why do I mention that? Why do I mention the story about a time when my dad swore and it affected me in a very real way. It's because in Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, believe it or not, we're going to be talking today about a time when God swore. And in swearing, it affected his son Jesus in a very real way. If you're taking notes today, today's message is called, Because My Dad Swore. And see, here's the thing. Do you know that there are moments in the Bible when God actually swears? Do you know that? In fact, there are moments in the Bible where God swears, and they're some of the most important moments in the Bible. They have significance even for us today, and we're going to talk about some of those moments today. See, now, in case you're wondering, in each case, the kind of swearing that God did was different from the kind of swearing that my dad did and the one that I did and what you do sometimes in traffic, if you have to be honest with yourself. It's not that kind of swearing about coarse words and four-letter words, that kind of thing, but it's a swearing of an oath which is also a four-letter word, but a different kind. And see, it's a swearing of an oath. Have you ever sworn an oath before? Many of you have. For example, when you testify as a witness in court, you will be getting up on a stand, you'll put a hand on the Bible maybe, raise another hand and say, I promise and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That's what we're doing. We're swearing. Another case is maybe you're a medical student, you're an accounting student, or you're an engineering student, or you're a law student. One day when you're finished all your training, you're going to get up in front of a council, and you will very likely be giving a sworn promise. You're going to swear that you are going to practice your profession with full integrity. See, what you're doing is you're giving an oath. And an oath is the most serious way that you can promise someone, I am telling the truth. You can count on what I'm saying. Now, you need to know this, is that... Do you need an oath to tell the truth? Of course not. You don't need an oath 
in order to tell the truth. In fact, in the Gospels, Jesus, in fact, tells us to be careful not to swear too much. Don't make so many oaths. Don't say, oh, I swear to God, or I swear to this, I swear. You don't need to say that. Instead, what Jesus says, he says, let your yes be yes, your no, no, anything else comes from the evil one. What does Jesus mean? He means this, don't be the kind of person who always needs an oath to bind you before you tell the truth. Just be an honest, truthful person generally, amen? And see, it's similar to sometimes when people will like, begin their sentences with honestly. Oh, you know, to be honest, do you do that sometimes? And it could just be an innocent habit. Oh, yeah, to be honest, I really think this. Uh, but honestly, I didn't really like, like we, we kind of say honestly, to be honest. And for you, maybe that's just a habit that you have. You don't mean anything by it. But let me tell you this, is that if you have that habit of saying honestly a lot, I would actually caution you to maybe consider maybe how much you want to use that word in your daily language. Why? It's because you will inevitably meet up with people who are listening to what you're saying, including yours truly, and if they hear you saying honestly a lot, then there's going to be a question in their head in the back of their mind. They may not say it, but they may say, okay, so when you don't say honestly, when you don't preface your words with to be honest, are you still being honest? Right? And so I, I would suggest that you kind of just take that out of your vocabulary uh, as much as you can to avoid just unnecessary questions about your own reputation. Instead, like Jesus says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. That said, that said, sometimes in certain important formal settings, we will swear an oath to show others that they can especially count on what we say. Now in Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, we're going to learn about two oaths that God swears. Here's the first one, Hebrews 6, 13. Let's read it together in a big, loud voice. What does it say? It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So what's going on? What is Pastor Hebrews? I call him Pastor Hebrews because we don't know the name of the author of Hebrews. We're just going to call him Pastor Hebrews. Pastor Hebrews is referring to a very famous scene in Genesis 22 where God tests Abraham's faith. Is that God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son called Isaac. I want you to take him up to a mountain. I want you to sacrifice your son on the altar. And though Abraham doesn't fully understand why, he still trusts God. He walks in obedience. And just before he's about to slay his son, God stops Abraham and says, don't, don't do that. Instead, kill that ram in your son's place. And after all of that, God does one more thing. He swears an oath. And the oath he swears to Abraham goes like this. Genesis 22, verse 16, would you read it with me? It says this, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So what's going on? Abraham is facing the biggest test of his life. And in the face of this test, he chooses to trust God, to trust and put his faith in God and not in himself. And so in response to the very courageous way that Abraham trusts God, God does something to Abraham. God swears to Abraham and says, I will surely bless you, Abraham. I will multiply you and all nations on earth will be blessed through your offspring. And if you understand the whole biblical story, you know that through your offspring is ultimately a reference to Jesus Christ. And because God swore on that day to Abraham, guess what? You and I get to benefit from that day when God swore, from that promise that God swore. Is that like Abraham, when you place your trust in God and not in yourself, regardless of your background, regardless of your culture, regardless of your ethnicity, is when you place your faith in God, like Abraham places faith in God, what happens is the Bible says, we, you, become descendants, spiritual descendants of Abraham. And through faith in Abraham's offspring, Jesus, we become sons and daughters of God. See, God didn't want just a family that's united by one race or one language. He didn't want that at all. 
He wanted a multicultural, multi-ethnic family that's international throughout history that is united by faith. And that's why when you look at the 2.4 billion Christians around the world today and billions more that are in heaven right now, that is all testament to how God is faithful to the promise he swore to Abraham when he said, I swear you will be blessed. I will bless you and all nations will be blessed through you and your offspring. In other words, because God swore we benefit. Today, the fact that you're even in church right now, you are standing on, benefiting from a sworn oath by God to Abraham. Now, go back to verse 16. We're going to take a look at something right now. Verse 16 says this. It says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. Stop right there. See, why does God say, I swear by myself? See, when people make an oath, they don't normally swear by themselves. They'll say, oh, I I swear to God, I'm not lying. I swear to God. In other words, if, if, I'm not, if I'm lying here, then may God be cursed and may I be cursed. Or people, if you're in an older generation, you might say, oh, I, I swear on my mother's grave that I'm telling you the truth. See, what's that? You're saying, if I'm not telling you the truth, may my mother's grave be cursed. What are we doing when we say that? When we say that, we are appealing to something that is greater, Something that is more sacred, that's more valuable to show how serious we are. That's why you'll never hear someone say, I swear on that mosquito. Or I swear on that dirty diaper. You're not going to hear that. Because you're swearing on something that's greater, more sacred than you. And see, when God swore to Abraham, because God wanted Abraham to be absolutely certain that God could be trusted in what he's about to say, God swore by himself. In other words, because there was nothing greater for God to swear by, God said, I swear on me. If I don't fulfill this promise, I'm a liar. And see, that's why Hebrews 6.13 says it this way. It says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Keep going to verse 16. It says, for people swear by someone greater than themselves, and all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. That's a long sentence. It's a beautiful sentence. And in other words, it's saying the reason God swore to Abraham wasn't because God is not trustworthy and he needs the pressure of an oath to keep him accountable. No, God by nature is most trustworthy, more trustworthy than any one of us here. God is faithful to every promise he would ever make. God is not one to lie, not one to change his mind. It's not in his nature to do so. And so when God swore to Abraham, it wasn't for God's sake. It was for Abraham's sake. And ultimately, it was for our sake. So that we who are prone to doubting, prone to questioning, prone to forgetting, prone to weakness, that we could have absolute confidence in what God has said. Or in the words of verse 18, God swore so that by two unchangeable things by which it is impossible for God to lie. And if you're wondering, what are those two unchangeable things? I would submit to you that they are God's nature, how he can't lie, his word, how he always fulfills his word. Those two things, by those two things, we can have strong encouragement, i.e. absolute certainty and full assurance of the hope that we have in Jesus. You know, I find this, I find this amazing that God would go out of his way to encourage us to believe in him. Do you, know, do, you, do you find that just kind of cool or amazing? Is that God is God. God could easily say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the boss. I'm the king. It's, you, I am God. And so I don't need you to feel anything before you obey me. Just do what I tell you because I'm always right. He could have just said it that way. But instead, amazingly, God goes out of his way to encourage our faith with an oath, with a promise. And it's because God knows that just like we've been talking about these past few weeks, faith is a heart condition. 
Faith is not just these intellectual tenets that you believe in your brain, but faith is a condition of your heart. How soft is your heart toward God? How humble is your heart toward God? How welcoming and like, how willing are you to receive what God has for you? That is faith. It's a heart condition. And when your heart is discouraged, God's agenda is he wants to encourage your faith with his word. And so if you find that you're really shaken up today by some circumstances that have been very difficult in your life, if that's you right now, then can I tell you, I'm so glad you're here because the best thing that you can do in this circumstance that's tough for you right now is to come to God, to hear God's word, and to hang on to God's promises. Promises like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Promises like, my grace is always sufficient for you. Promises like, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Plans or promises like, you know, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. These are God's promises given to us for our encouragement so that we could have full confidence to trust in God and not just hear promises, but to fully rely on them. Because let me tell you this, it is in trusting God's promises and not just hearing them that we experience the power, the peace, and the blessing that God has made available to us. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Aren't you glad that God swears? Oh, I'm so glad that God swears. God swears so that you can have absolute confidence in his promises. Let's look at a second instance in Hebrews 6 and 7 where God swears. We looked at the first one. Let's look at the second one right now. Hebrews 6, 19. Would you read it with me? What does it say? It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Everyone say Melchizedek. That's a tough name. If you're maybe expecting a baby, congratulations. Maybe you want to name your baby Melchizedek. How about that? Mel for short, maybe. But see, who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek is one of those fascinating characters in all the Bible. There are only three places in the Bible where Melchizedek is mentioned. Do you know where they are? One is Genesis 14. Brief mention of him there. Another is Psalm 110 even briefer mention. Those are the only two times you hear about him in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, there's just one place where you can find the mention of Melchizedek. It's in the book of Hebrews. And so if we didn't have Pastor Hebrews inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us the book of Hebrews, we would have no insight from the New Testament about this Melchizedek. Now, why is Melchizedek even more important? Why is that even significant for us? See, why is Pastor Hebrews bringing up Melchizedek? Let me tell you why. It's because Pastor Hebrews is trying to answer a question which is, how can Jesus be a priest? We talked a couple weeks ago about how Jesus, he is our priest and friend forever. The one who's fully God, fully man, how he's the bridge that leads us to God. He is the one who intercedes for us as our priest. He is the perfect priest. But on what basis can he be a priest? Because I don't know if you know this, but in the nation of Israel, under the law of Moses, priests needed to be born into a certain tribe, the tribe of Levi, and they had to be born into the family line of Aaron, the very first high priest that Moses appointed. You had to be born in exactly that line, that tribe, if you wanted to be a priest. But see, Jesus wasn't from that tribe. He was from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. He's not from Aaron's family line. So on what basis can anyone say that Jesus is a priest, let alone the great high priest, as Hebrews says? See, in answering this question, Pastor Hebrews makes this brilliant connection between Melchizedek in the Old Testament and Jesus. Genesis 14, 17 gives us the background. Read it with me. It says, After Abraham returned from defeating Kedalarmor and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. So what's going on? See, long before Moses, long before Aaron, the first high priest, long before the nation of Israel was formed or had any priests at all, here we have Abraham, also known as Abraham or Abram here. And he is in a battle against a group of kings. Why? Why is Abraham fighting kings? Well, it's because a band of kings has decided to raid the land of Sodom where Abraham's nephew called Lot is living. And so these band of kings, they 
invade Sodom. They kidnap Lot and his family and they take him away. And when Abraham hears about it, he is like, we got to do something. We got to rescue my family. And so he leads a small army of like 318 guys and they go and they find this band of kings and like a bear robbed of his cubs, he rescues his family. He brings them back. And see, Genesis 14, 17 is when he is coming back from that victorious battle. And on his way back from defeating these kings, Abraham is met by another king. And this king's name is Melchizedek. And so you notice this. Not only is Melchizedek a king, but verse 18 says something else that's interesting about Melchizedek. Look at Genesis 14, 18. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. So this guy's a king and a priest. Verse 19 says, and he blessed Abraham, saying, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So what's going on? Abraham's returning from battle, and he meets Melchizedek, a king and a priest. In fact, he's the first priest you see in the Bible. He's the first. And he comes to Abraham, he blesses him, And in response, Abraham gives him a tithe, which is a tenth of everything. And see, Pastor Hebrews, in Hebrews 6 and 7, wants you to see some parallels between Melchizedek and Jesus. Let's look at just a few of them right now. What are some ways that Melchizedek is very much like Jesus? Let's look at a few right now. You can take good notes. You can maybe snap some because we're going to go through them really fast. Number one, Melchizedek is both a king and a priest, just like Jesus. Hebrews 7.1 says, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Now, this is unusual. You don't find in scripture times when a guy is both king and priest. Kings were not priests. Priests were not kings. That was just that's something that did not happen. In fact, the only other time you ever see that in the Bible, his name is Jesus. Jesus is a king and a priest. He's the only one. Melchizedek and Jesus, they're the only ones who are both kings and priests at the same time. That's the first parallel. Number two, Melchizedek is called king of righteousness and king of peace. Hebrews 7, 2 says this. His name means, he's talking about Melchizedek. His name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. So Melchizedek, he is called king of righteousness, king of peace. Who does that remind you of? Number three, there was no apparent beginning or end to Melchizedek's priesthood. So in other words, Melchizedek's priesthood, him being a priest, doesn't seem to ever have a beginning or an end to it. Look at Hebrews 7 verse 3. It says, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. What's going on here? See, usually in the nation of Israel, a priest will be born into the tribe of Levi, into the line of Aaron, and you would know his father you would know his mother. And you would also know that this guy is a descendant, a longtime descendant of the first high priest, Aaron. And then this guy, when he's old enough, he will serve as a priest. And for the next few years, decades even, he will serve as a priest until the day he dies. And then someone after him is his successor who takes over after him. That's the usual thing that happens with priests. But see, with Melchizedek, we never hear about his family tree. We don't know who his dad is. We don't know who his mom is. We never read of his birth. We never hear of his death. And at least on paper, on the paper of scripture, it's that it seems like Melchizedek is without beginning of days or end of life, as Pastor Hebrew says. In other words, it's almost like there's no end to his priesthood. It's like he's almost got like this forever priesthood, just like someone else. His name is Jesus. Number four, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. Who does that remind you of? Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he offered it to Abraham. See, Melchizedek, he does that, and you know what? Who's famous for bringing out bread and wine? Oh, you know his name. It's Jesus again. See, the night before Jesus is crucified, before he gives his life on the cross to pay for our sins, this is what Jesus does with his disciples. You guys are all familiar with it. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20, this is Jesus. It's like, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then 20, verse 20, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so what's going on? For over, so over a thousand years before Jesus appears in the New Testament, here you have this guy, Melchizedek, who sounds a lot like Jesus. He's both king and priest. He's king of righteousness 
king of peace. He's got no beginning. He's got no end. He brings up bread and wine. He blesses Abraham, even receives a tithe from Abraham. And it leads to this question, who are you, Melchizedek? Who are you? Are you Jesus? Is that, or is he some other God? That can't be true. Like, that, that, that can't be it. Is he like a temporary appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament? Some scholars think that. I personally think the most accurate way to think of it is this, is that Melchizedek is a type of Christ. In other words, Melchizedek is a person who appears in the Old Testament and and his existence there points us to the work and the person of Jesus. It's like a signpost that's saying, over here, over here, Jesus is over here. And see, that's what Melchizedek is. And why is that significant? It just goes to show that many, many centuries before you even had a New Testament, you already had the Old Testament pointing us to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Genesis 14 is that very brief little scene where we see Melchizedek. And then throughout the rest of Old Testament, you will only see one more reference to Melchizedek. Do you know where it is? Psalm 110. Let's go to that right now. See, Psalm 110 is where David has already received a promise from God. God has promised to David, one day, David, a son of yours, a descendant of yours is going to be king and he's going to rule forever. And see, David, he is captivated by this promise. He can't stop thinking about this promise. Whenever he's praying, he's thinking about that promise. And eventually one day he writes down Psalm 110. And this psalm is about the son that's going to be born to him one day in his line, a descendant of his who's going to be king forever. And with a prophetic vision in his heart inspired by the Holy Spirit, King David starts to write about this son who will rule one day. And this is what he writes in Psalm 110 verse 2. Read it with me. It says, the Lord The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty. From the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth. This is very poetic, majestic language. Simply describe how this son of David will one day be king forever. But then David goes on to describe one more thing about the son. Verse 4 says this. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? In other words, David has received a vision from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that one day a son will be born to him who will be king forever, but not just a king, he will be a priest. And not just any priest. This priest will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I'm just trying to put myself in David's shoes. Because see, you you gotta understand this. David was a king, he wasn't a priest. He had the heart of a priest, but he didn't have the office of a priest. And so for him, he could relate to the idea of being a king. I could see that. I could see my son ruling as a king forever. Yeah, I love that. I love that vision. But a priest? All this time, David's experience of priests, these are these weak, fallible guys who come out of the tribe of Levi, the line of Aaron, and they come and they go. And they're weak and fallible just like him. And he's like, is that the kind of son that's gonna be born to me? And as he's praying, as he's thinking on these things, he senses strongly something from God saying, no, not like that. And God takes David back to Genesis 14, where there's a priest, the very first priest you see in all the Bible. His name is Melchizedek. He has no beginning. He has no end. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit is nudging his, his, uh, David saying, he's going to be like that in the order of Melchizedek. And so that's why in verse four, he writes, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that's why this is who Jesus is. Because God swore it. Jesus is that offspring of Abraham by whom all nations are blessed. Because God swore it. Jesus is the son of King David who will rule on a throne forever. And because God swore it. Jesus is the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 7, verse 20 puts it this way. It says, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he, that's Jesus, became a priest with an oath. When God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And it's because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. In other words, when you look at the life of Jesus here on this earth, you notice that There was no name that's been more maligned, more abused, more criticized, more questioned than the name of Jesus. Even to this day, 
maybe even more today than ever it was 2,000 years ago. Just think of it. Today on this planet, there are people, even at this moment, praising Jesus' name, and there's people all over this planet using Jesus' name as a curse word right now. And see, Jesus' name, there's no other name like Jesus in terms of how much adoration Jesus gets, in terms of much, as, as much abuse as Jesus gets. And see, when Je- it all started when Jesus lived on this earth, where he's doing what he's doing, and people calling him demon-possessed. They're like, you're satanic. You're possessed, man. You're crazy. You're a liar. You're a blasphemer. You're a false teacher. They're saying all these things, making all these judgments and accusations, not understanding who he is. And I believe that in his heart, Jesus would think back to two things. He would think back to his baptism when he comes out of the water and the father says to him, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And it secures his heart. But he thinks about one more thing. It's when God swore to him. His dad swore to him and said, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You see, Jesus, in the face of trying to figure out who am I going to believe about who I am, decides I'm going to hang on to God's sworn promise. And see, what's the lesson for us in this? It's very simple, but it's so important. You are who God says you are. You are not who other people who don't know you say you are. You are who God says you are. You know, we all got battles to fight. Maybe you're fighting a battle right now. Maybe it's a bunch of battles right now that you're fighting. And I can't predict with specificity all the battles that you're gonna you know, have to face in your future one day. But I can not just predict, but I can guarantee that you will face this battle. In fact, you might be facing this battle right now. It's a battle for your identity. It's a battle because there will be times in your life when people will say things about you that are not necessarily true. When people will say things about you that might even be false, they might be untrue, they might even be hurtful and mean. And those people might be in your workplace, those people might be on the street, those people might be in your school, those people might be in your home. You might be married to that person. Those people might be, you know what, that person could even be yourself. Where you just often speak awful things about yourself that aren't true. You're such a loser. No one loves you. You don't matter. And, and, just, and that just comes up over and over again. And there's almost like there's a battle in your mind to say, who am I going to believe? Who am I? And see, here's the thing. Because there's a battle going on for your identity concerning what are you going to believe about yourself. And whether you win or lose that battle, it all depends on who you choose to believe. Let me give you some examples. Throughout my lifetime, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of people bring a lot of great encouragement into my life. And I don't know where I'd be without that encouragement. Also, throughout my lifetime, I've had people say some interesting things to me or about me. And when I mention these, I mean, I mean them with absolutely zero ill will. I've processed them in my heart for years. I can say that, you know, to the extent that the forgiveness was needed, forgiveness has been granted. To the extent that I used to be angry, I'm not angry anymore. You know, it's just one of those things where I can say, I love those people. I know that God loves them as well. I bless those people. But this is just to show you that you're not alone. Here are just a few examples of some things that people have said to me in my past. Once I was sitting in a boardroom many, many years ago, and I was with another person that I'd been working with for a while. And uh, out of the blue, for reasons that I can't really figure out even to this day, he started talking to me and saying, you know, you're nothing. You're nothing. You've never done anything significant. You're never going to amount to anything important. I was like, okay, can we just keep on working on this document together? I was like, like, "Why, why say that? Anyways, that was one. Once I was in a family dinner and, uh, one of the uncles was sitting across from us. I was sitting with Pastor Shar and all these family members around. And for some reason, this uncle started to, I guess, make comments about every person. And then he started to sit, point to Pastor Shar, pointed to Pastor Shar and said, and then he looked at me straight in the eye, said, Phew. <laughs> Phew. and I thought he meant it as a joke, but he was actually kind of serious. And he did it again later to me personally. And I was like, I don't know. I I guess you're just kind of drunk right now. And he was a little drunk. Um, Another time, I was 19 years old. And it was around that time that I was just feeling like God was putting in my heart this dream of maybe being a pastor one day. 
And uh, I asked a very important family member in my life, someone whose opinion means a lot to me. And I, I remember I asked this family member, hey, like, if I were to become a pastor one day, w- would you be proud of me? And this family member said, no, nope. no, I wouldn't. I was like, why not? He said, because, you know, being a pastor, it, it, it's, it's, it's all soft skills, you know? There's no real expertise. There's no real knowledge involved. It's all the soft skills. Um, obviously, that didn't stop me, but that was something that happened. Um, I remember over 10 years ago, my sister was getting baptized. And for me, that was a really big moment because ever since we were in high school, I was, I was praying for my sister. And I remember when it was just much, much, much later, when we were kind of like in our late 20s, early 30s, when she finally decided to get baptized. And I remember she called me and asked if I could help baptize her. And for me, that was a really cool moment. And I remember she was going to another church at the time where their baptism service was on a Saturday night at the beach in downtown. And back then, many, many years ago, Thrive was a Saturday night church. We would have services on Saturday nights and we'd just sleep in on Sunday. But this is what happened is that, you know, I was like, I, I, I want to make it a point to be at my sister's baptism. This is a once in a lifetime thing. So, you know, and it's not uncommon for us to do this. We arranged for a guest speaker to speak uh, at our Saturday night service. And I went to the baptism. I went into the water at the beach. It was just an amazing moment. I remember the sun shining down. I got a chance to pray for my sister and we baptized my sister. She came out of the water. I hugged her, said, I love you. And then I ran out of the water. I dried myself with a towel. I changed, I got into the car and I bolted to our Saturday night service just in time to close off the service like I sometimes do here at Thrive. And it was funny. I was telling people on the stage about how sad I was about my sister's baptism, something we've been praying about for so many years. People were clapping. Their people. But then there was someone at the end of the service who came up to me at the end of all of that. And I guess it was just a visitor who was just visiting the church. She came up to me. He said, your commitment to this church has problems. There's something wrong with your commitment to this church. And I was like, I didn't want to go out of my way to explain, you know, okay, this is a once in a lifetime thing for my sister. And I came back as soon as I could. I just didn't feel the need to do that. But why do I mention any of these? It's because it just goes to show you're not alone. And there will be people in your life that you encounter who will sometimes make all sorts of judgments about you and say all sorts of things about you that are not necessarily true. And the battle that you are engaged in every day is whose words am I going to believe? See, I'm not saying you can't take criticism. We all need people that love us, who we trust to speak into our lives. But in the battle for your identity, sometimes you're going to have to distinguish between what is helpful, important, loving, constructive feedback and what is unloving, unfair, inaccurate, unnecessary judgment. You're going to have to make a distinction there because if you internalize all of it, it's going to drive you insane and it's going to mislead you into having a misunderstanding of who you are. And so if you're here today and you really struggle with injuries, not from physical beatings necessarily, but from verbal beatings that you've received from someone or people in your life and often it haunts you, the stuff that they said, can I tell you this? The best thing that you can do is discover and remember and engrave in your heart what God says about you. Because the message of the Bible is not that you're nothing. It's that you are loved. The message of the Bible is not that you are garbage. It's that you are treasured. The message of the Bible is not that you're some accident, but you are chosen. The message of the Bible is not that you are a mistake. It's that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's masterpiece. The message of the Bible is not that you are worthless, it's that you matter to God. The message of the Bible is not that you're just lost, but we were lost, but God found us. That we're not just broken, but we're here broken still, but God is making us whole through Jesus. The message of the Bible is your life is worth living. Would someone give God some praise in this place for what God says about you? And so anytime you think about that mean or hurtful or false word that someone spoke to you or about you, remember this, you are not who that person says you are. You are who God says you are. Turn your neighbor and say, you are who God says you are. You are who God says you are. So whenever I think about that time in the boardroom when that guy said, you're nothing, you'll never amount to anything, you've never done anything, anything good or significant in your life, 
in response in my heart, not to him, but just in my heart, I can say, that's not true. Or when that woman 12 years ago or so criticized my uh, commitment to my church and said, your commitment has problems, I can think on that moment and say, God bless this person, but that's not true. Or when that relative of mine said, you know, if you become a pastor, I won't be proud of you. I can say, that's okay, because it's not that person's opinion that matters most, it's God's opinion that matters most. And when another relative gives me that hand gesture, I can laugh it off and remember that it's not that hand gesture that defines who I am, it's this hand gesture. It's the cross where Jesus died for me, amen? It's because you are who Jesus says you are. You are who God says you are. And because of that, your life is worth living. That's why every, mor- every morning, it's helped me get ready for the day. And I've shared a little bit of this with some of you already in the past month, is that I'll make this declaration about myself, to myself. Um, and I put it on my phone. And so kind of in the morning, I'll either read it or I can read it out loud. And I read part of it for you guys a few weeks ago. Let me read to you another part, which I, I'll say this pretty much to myself every day. I'll say, my worth is not based on what people say about me but what God says about me. People's opinions are not how I measure my worth. My worth is not defined by how many likes we get on Facebook or YouTube, but by the cross where Jesus died for me. See, that's how I help to gain victory in the battle for my identity. And see, just like Abraham fought kings in order to rescue his family, there are certain battles that God has made you to fight. See, you got to understand this. A lot of people think, oh, when I believe in Jesus, everything's going to be so easy and good. No. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. You were not made to live life without any battles. In fact, until the day you see Jesus face to face, you will face more battles. And some of those battles are exactly the battles that God made you to fight. And here's the thing. The thing to do when you're facing a battle isn't to run away from it, but it's to face it in Jesus' name with the wisdom and power that are in him. And see, maybe you are in a battle today. We've talked about one battle, a battle for your identity, but maybe you're in another battle right now. Maybe you're in a battle for your marriage. Maybe you're in a battle for your kids. Maybe you're in a battle for your mental health right now. Maybe you're in a battle for the health of, if not you, someone you love. Can I tell you this? There is something you need to know from the story of Melchizedek and Abraham if you're in a battle right now, which is this. There is blessing after the battle. There is blessing after the battle. This battle will not be forever. There's blessing after the battle. Just as Abraham came back from battling those kings and Melchizedek blessed Abraham, so let me tell you this, I guarantee you, there is a blessing waiting for you at the end of your battle. So you don't want to give up. You want to face the battles that God has put you in. You want to stay in the fight because the blessing will all be worth it. Amen. And see, you got to remember one more thing if you're in a battle right now, is that victory and success don't depend all on you. Victory and success are in God's hands. Just as, remember what Melchizedek said to Abraham after Abraham came back? And he blesses Abraham, and he says, he first he's, he blesses Abraham, and then he says, this, he says, blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hands. In other words, he's reminding Abraham, hey, the reason why you came back from that battle victorious against those kings wasn't simply because you tried really hard or because you're so able, resourceful, such a good leader, you know, so experienced, or your luck, whatever that's all, whatever that is. But instead, it's blessed be God most high who delivered those enemies to you. In other words, in the battles that God made you to fight, victory isn't all depending on you, your hard work, your smarts, your ability to figure things out, your experience, or your luck, whatever that means. Victory and success are in God's hands. God most high. And so when you experience victory, when you experience success, when you experience a blessing, when these things come your way, the most appropriate thing you do, thank God. Credit God. Don't just walk away and go, oh, phew, that was nice. But you thank God. In fact, one final point we're going to end with today. See, notice how Abraham, after he received the blessing, after he experienced the victory, he thanked God. And how did he do so? Look at Hebrews 7, verse 2. It says, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. See, in response to the blessing, the victory that God Most High made possible for Abraham, Abraham gave God a tenth 
of what he received. You know what that's called? That is called a tithe. See, a tithe literally means a tenth. And a tithe is something that Abraham did. Tithing is something that we, as children of Abraham, spiritual descendants of Abraham, what we do as well. See, what is a tithe? In case you're wondering. A tithe is when we give the first 10% of what we receive and we give it back to God. We say, okay, God, the first 10% is yours. There's no negotiation there. That's just, it's yours. I give it to you. Why is that? And if you're wondering, by the way, what's the difference between a tithe and an offering? A tithe is the first 10% that you give. An offering is everything above that that you give. And see, why do we tithe? There's three reasons we do so. Number one is when we give our first 10% to God, what we're doing practically is we're learning to put God first in our lives. It's one thing to sing songs, oh God, you're first place in my life. I live for you, all for one name, all right. But then it's another thing when in a very real, practical way, you start giving the first part of your income to God and saying in a very real way, in a way where the rubber hits the road, you say, God, you are my first priority, really. Not just with lip service, but when it comes to my wallet and my bank account, I'm gonna make you first in my finances. That's your portion, you get that. And see, that's the first reason. It's a way to put God first. It's a form of worship unto God. There's another one. Which is when we tithe, we're giving God room to bless us even more. See, Malachi chapter 3 is a very important chapter on the topic of tithing. And Malachi 3 is worth reading. We don't, we're not going to read all of it right now. I'm just going to show you one verse from it. Could you read with me? You guys have been awesome so far today. Would you read this in a big, loud voice with you right now? Verse 10 says, bring, or, oh, yeah, there you go. Right? One, two, three. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. What's going on here? You know, you, you, you remember that part where, you know, the Bible says, don't put God to the test. Don't test God. Don't put God to, God to the test. You know what? There's one place in all the Bible where God actually invites you to test him. It's in the area of tithing. He says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing on you that you won't have room enough for it when you tithe, when you give your first part to God, when you honor God with the first fruits of your wealth. He says, test me in this, bet on this, that I'm going to provide for you in ways that you don't even imagine. See, tithing is not just worship unto God, but tithing is us believing in a very, very real way that when we really seek God's kingdom first, he will add what he will add, everything we need. And see, number three, when we tithe, we're taking care of the church that God gave us. See, Malachi chapter three says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food, where? In my house. See, tithing is not just your worship to God. Tithing is not even just you betting on God and trusting God to add everything you need. But even more, it serves a very practical purpose. It's to take care of the house of God. It's to take care of your church. And when you tithe regularly, what you're doing is you're taking good care of your church. When you don't tithe regularly, not only does Malachi say you're stealing from God, but you are actually mistreating and depriving your church. And see, this is something that I'll just ask those who call Thrive Church your home church right now. If you're new to here, you know, of course, this is something you can just listen in on. Let me ask you this. Here at Thrive, if you call Thrive your home church, are you a contributor or are you a consumer? Are you a contributor or are you a consumer? How do you know if you're one or the other? Well, you can talk about this. Like, am I serving here at Thrive? That's a good one. You know, but here's another one is that if we were to take the way that you give here at Thrive in terms of tithes and offerings, and we were to call that way, your way of giving, the model that we want everyone else to follow, and so the way you give, we want everyone else to give. I'm not talking about exact amounts, because of course we're all in different situations, but in terms of your habits, in terms of your intentionality. If we're to take the way that you give, and we apply that across hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people here at Thrive Church and said, we want to give exactly like this person. Let me ask you, what condition would Thrive Church be in? Would Thrive Church be on the streets? Or would Thrive Church have more than enough? 
Let me ask you that. Maybe, just maybe, if every single person here at Thrive Church really did tithe, really gave that first 10% to God, maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't just be renters. Maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't need a setup crew to come to a place that doesn't belong to us and set up at 6.30 or 6 a.m. in the morning. Maybe, just maybe. I don't know. Who knows? It's not that your renting is so much worse than owning. It's not, I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about maybe, just maybe, there are things that would be possible with us as a church that would not be possible if we're just consumers. Not just maybe. It's for sure. Amen? And God's called us to that. See, I'm here to tell you today that... When you receive a victory, a blessing, success, don't just go, oh, that's great. You want to thank God. And one of the ways we do so is through how we give. You know, let me ask you this. Have you experienced a victory this past week? Maybe a very special blessing in your family? Did you lead someone to Christ? Did you get through a really painful trial and now you're out of it? And you're, oh, praise God that that is done. Or maybe you, a, ble- a special opportunity or blessing landed in your lap and you didn't even orchestrate it. You didn't even ask for it and it came, you know, all those. Or maybe it's just been a really tough season in your life and you're still standing. You still got breath in your lungs. You're still praising God. Guess what? Every single one of those situations, that is a victory from God. That is success from God most high. That is a blessing. And you have every reason to say, God, you've been good to me. I'm going to give back to you. Question for you. Do you tithe? Do you put God first in your finances? How well have you been taking care of God's house through your tithes and offerings? You'll notice tithing is something that came long before the law of Moses. And so people who say, you know what, tithing is just a law thing. It's a law of Moses thing. And so law of Moses doesn't really apply to us anymore. So tithing doesn't really apply to us anymore. Uh, You got to understand this. Tithing came way before Moses. Tithing started with Abraham, your spiritual father who gave one-tenth to Melchizedek to say thank you for the blessing. And the same way, we continue, continue to do that today as a way to honor God, as a way to trust in him, and as a way to take good care of the church that he put in our lives. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. You guys have been awesome today. And uh, God's been even more awesome. But let me just end by telling you seven things to summarize Uh, real quick, like bang, 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 bang. What did we learn today? Number one, tell the truth with or without an oath. Don't be like, oh, honestly, to be honest, no need, just just tell the truth. (laughs) Number two, in difficult circumstances, go to God, hear God's word, trust his promises. Because it's in trusting God's promises that we experience his power, his peace. Number three, centuries before the New Testament was written, the Old Testament was already pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our greatest example today, Melchizedek. Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Number four, you are who God says you are. You are not what other people who don't know you say you are. You are who God says you are. And because of that, life is worth living. Number five, are you in a battle right now? Hang on, there's blessing after the battle. So don't give up, stay in the fight. Number six, remember that victory and success don't all depend on you. They're in God's hands. So trust God. Trust that he's in control and that he will make a way. And number seven, to thank God for past blessings and to make room for new ones, let's give our tithes faithfully to God because he is worthy of all of our praise. Would someone give God some praise right now? Church, would you stand to your feet? Would you worship the one who is God most high? And there's just so much we've unpacked here in Hebrews 6 and 7, stuff that wasn't just meant to go in your head and out, but stuff that you want to put in your heart. We're going to do that right now through the band leading a song, through prayer that I'm going to lead you in as well. Let's make this our time to draw near to God. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, Jesus is our living hope. There is hope because Jesus is hope. And if you need that hope today, if you realize that you need someone to forgive you of your sins, you need peace from God, you need a relationship with God, then I'm here to let you know all of that is available in Jesus Christ. He is our living hope. And if you want to receive that living hope today, whether you've never been to church before, this is your first time, or you've been here before, it's as simple as coming to God honestly and humbly and just asking Him for a new beginning in your life. And we're going to invite you to just pray.
pray this prayer with me. If you're online, you can click the link in your chat room. If you're here on site, why don't you just lift up your hand to God right now. If that's you and you realize you need Jesus to be your living hope, I would encourage you to lift your hand to God right now. We're also going to pray this out loud together with those praying for the first time. Let's just pray this right now. Say, Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you you that because you love me, you you died on the cross to pay for my sins. You rose again to give me life. Today, I open up my heart. I ask you, please forgive me of all my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I place my trust, not in what I do, but in what you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would someone shout to God today? Praise God. If you prayed that prayer, we encourage you on your next step. It's called baptism. Everyone say baptism. Baptism Baptism is not for the graduates. Baptism is for the beginners. It's for those of you who just received Jesus Christ into your life. For more info on baptism, go to mythrive.info, press the baptism button, and that will give you all the information you need on baptism and to sign up for our next baptism service.